much, Anne, um, and just welcome um, everyone uh, for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for taking the time to join Park City Education Foundation and Communities That Care for our student success in the age of COVID panel discussion. I'm Kara Cody with Park City Education Foundation and I oversee programs. I'm also parent of a fourth grader at Trailside Elementary. Uh, while we get started, I have an icebreaker question um, while we wait for some others to join. Um, and our question centers around uh, the world is different right now. Life has changed. So as a parent, what is one thing that you've had to let go of during COVID? Um, there is our question. If you would like to answer that in our chat feature uh, down at the bottom of the screen, um, I feel like we're all probably pretty familiar with Zoom at this point, but um, it is down at the bottom. If you click on that and then chat, you can go ahead and, oh, normal schedules. I hear you there. Control, yeah, that is a, a very tough one. Um, that, yeah, our world certainly looks different. Um, and while we continue to um, answer the question, um, I do have a couple of housekeeping um, items that I'll just go over uh, right now. Um, uh, the first is that, as you can see, we are recording um, our panel uh, discussion this evening. Um, and the link will be available um, if anybody would like to uh, rewatch or share it with um, anybody who couldn't attend this evening. Uh, so please watch out for the link in a couple of days. And our flow this evening, uh, we'll start out with our introductions. Um, then we have some prepared questions uh, for our three panelists this evening. Uh, then we will take some questions from the audience. Um, please use the Q&A feature uh, down at the bottom of the, uh, the Zoom screen. There'll be a Q&A. Uh, click on that and you can go ahead and type in your question. Uh, please keep in mind that we do have limited time uh, for questions from the audience and we may not get to everyone's question. And if we didn't uh, get to your question, we apologize, but know that time is precious and we want to uh, honor everyone's uh, time uh, by finishing right at or around six o'clock. Uh, so we have about an hour. Um, finally, um, I would like to recognize a special guest that we have this evening, uh, Anna Stampfley. Thank you so much for attending on behalf of Park City School District. Thank you um, for having give, me. <laughs> excellent, thank you. I'll give you a more formal introduction at the end, uh, but grateful that she is able to join us. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, Dr. Gilday um, has a Park City School Board um, meeting this evening. Um, a little bit of a scheduling um, hiccup on my part, uh, scheduling an event for Tuesday night that centers around schools. But you know what, lesson learned, and I will not let perfection be the enemy of good and we'll move on. So um, that is the flow. Um, so I am going to launch right in. Um, Park City Education Foundation leads the community in funding initiatives that inspire all Park City students to successfully reach their academic and lifelong potential. Since 1986, PCEF has been a trusted resource for improving public education in the Park City School District. We exist because Utah is the lowest funded public education system in the country and we work to change that equation each and every day. Like the rest of the world, the pandemic has caused a shift in our work. This fall, we sought to learn about the needs and challenges facing our Park City schools, teachers, students, and how we can best respond to them. What we learned from our students. Um, I'd like to share um, a word cloud. Um, if you could um, click onto that, um, the next slide, Mitch. Um, this is a, a word cloud um, that centered around um, students' reactions uh, to what is good about school this year. As you can see, students are very grateful for their teachers. And research has proven that classroom teachers are the number one factor in student success. What we learned from our teachers is that they're stressed, fatigued, and anxious in their heroic efforts to keep our students safe and learning. The beginning of the school year felt like the end of the school year to many. To share more about the stress teachers are facing, I'd like to share a quote from a Park City School District teacher. I would like some communication sent to parents that manages expectations better regarding what we can offer during this COVID mitigation version of school. It is very stressful that parents seem to believe we are operating business as usual. In fact, almost nothing in the classroom is being done in our usual way. It can't be right now. I've encountered negative critiques of the way I'm teaching and the assignments I've posted. It's demoralizing. No one is more aware that, I, that my practice isn't up to my usual standards than I am. 
I literally cannot engage in the structures and routines that I usually do because COVID mitigation and significantly reduced prep time render the usual impossible. This teacher is not alone. To help our teachers, administrators, and staff, Park City Education Foundation has launched our Educator Wellness Initiative. This discussion is part of our commitment to our educators. You can find more information about the initiative as well as other programs at PCEF4, the number four, kids.org. The world looks different and school is different. This evening, let's start the conversation about how we redefine success. It is now my pleasure to introduce my co-host this evening, Mary, Mary Krista Smith with Communities That Care. Thank you so much, Kara. It's such a pleasure to be on this call with the community. We have 96 folks who have registered for this webinar today. So although you can't see each other, um, we're together um, in this call and in this space and time. I am Mary Krista Smith and I'm the Executive Director of Communities That Care. And we are the prevention coalition for our community, really focused on youth and family health and mental well being. And our role is to connect the dots and gather together all the youth serving organizations in our community so that we are working collaboratively to elevate youth health and well being. It's such a pleasure to work with the Park City Education Foundation and Park City School District to offer this important webinar tonight. I'm also a mother of. Uh, freshman at the University of Utah and a sixth grader at Ecker Hill Middle School. And I really need this webinar tonight myself. Um, this week has been a massive letting go of expectations and um, assumptions that I have around holiday season. And I'm so delighted to welcome our three panelists this evening, people I know both personally and professionally. And we've invited you all here, Sam, Brad, and Jennifer, because you are trusted experts in our community and we are so grateful to have you here. So I'm just going to give a little introduction of our three panelists. And then um, we will begin with our uh, first round of questions, which allows them to do a deeper introduction of themselves and their work. Dr. Brad Reedy, Brad, you can wave, is a co-owner and clinical director of Evoke Family Therapy Programs, an experientially based therapy program for adolescents, young adults, and families. Previously as owner and partner, Brad served as a primary therapist, clinical director, and executive director for Second Nature Wilderness Program, helping that program to become the most successful wilderness therapy program in the country. And although it's not written here in the bio, he is author of a number of books. And one of them, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, sits on my desk at work. And I loaned it to Kara the other day. So highly recommend. Sam Walsh, Sam, will you please give a little wave, is the intervention counselor at Park City High School. And she provides social and emotional support for all students. And Sam is the go-to person when we need to know what is happening with our kids and is really that trusted adult within the Park City School District and the high school who um, supports students in their mental health journey um, and is there for them. I mean, when I think about what you do at school, Sam, that we could spend the rest of the day talking about what you see and do and how you help the kids. So thank you for being here as that direct person working with kids in schools. We so appreciate your perspective. Thank you so and, much for having me. Thank you. And Jennifer, will you give a little wave? This is my dear friend and, um, and local parkite, Jennifer Mulholland. And she is the mother of two children, 10 years old and 15 years old, who attend school in Park City. She is a wife and co-leader of Plenty, which is a consulting firm helping conscious companies, nonprofits, and leaders make a difference in the world. She facilitates, speaks, and coaches online and around the globe and at HeartSpace, Plenty's beautiful retreat center in Park City. And as Jennifer and I have spoken over the last few months, I know that so many of your clients are facing the same kinds of questions that we have today. So we appreciate this kind of broad and varied experience that you all are bringing to the table. So welcome, Jennifer, Brad, and Sam. Thank you. So great to be here. 
Kara is going to lead off with our first question. You're muted. Okay, a little, uh, little Zoom, Zoom issue there. Forgot to unmute myself. I'm the queen of that. <laughs> but um, uh, my first question is for all three panelists. Um, what are you seeing with your clients and students? What advice are you giving with how to redefine success and manage expectations? And why don't we start with, with Jennifer, if that is okay? Sure. Um, <clears throat> seeing a lot of insecurity in the uncertainty is a, is a general theme that people are really trying to find their way to find their grounding some are feeling really hopeful about the future and some are feeling really lost and overwhelmed in the roles of parents and professionals, personal and work lives converging. Um, it's a lot of our work as Mary Krista introduced is done with individual leaders who are trying to become more conscious, which means literally more awake and aware of themselves and of others, more aligned to what they care about and their true unique blueprint and connected um, to others in their family, in their communities, in their businesses, in the spirit of making a, this world a better place. And that calling, that wiring to want to do good, to be good um, has been stirred up in, at this time where it's just been a lot of change for people and I would say not all people are wired to do well and change. And so that's a new comfort level to get more familiar with, you know, the old adage that the only thing that is ever constant is change. And yes, that is a nice jingle, but at the end of the day, not everyone really enjoys or employs a, a life, a day of change. And I think we're trying, we're getting more, we're needing to become more comfortable with that. So the skill sets that people can have to find their grounding, find that personal way that helps them control themselves rather than control the external world, control others, whether that's their kids or meeting schedule or deadlines or whatever that is, is, is a shift I think a lot of people are going through more to say, but I'll, I'll pause there so other people can get a word in edgewise. And just Brad, from, what are you, oh, go ahead. I just wanted to say from the school perspective, yeah. I think it's important to start with many, many students are doing very well, right? Um, they're back at school with, you know, all of these changes from these unprecedented times. And I'm just always inspired every day. I love working with teenagers and talking with them and hearing their perspectives and just how hopeful and resilient they are about the future. Um, but with that said, it's certainly, there's certainly a different feel at the high school this year, certainly a different feeling in the community and in our world um, that we obviously have to acknowledge um, that some students who maybe weren't struggling before with social and emotional issues or sadness and isolation, certainly we're seeing kids struggle that maybe we hadn't seen before. Um, and as well as adults and families, um, there are definitely struggles that people are having that go along with, with these uncertain times. Um, and with you know a global pandemic, that's certainly gonna raise everybody's anxiety, right? It's pretty normal for everybody's normal level of anxiety um, to tick up. Um, so I think it's really important for parents um, or caregivers and educators as well, like include myself in that, to really monitor our own stress level and anxiety. We can have stress and anxiety and worries and maybe we have risk factors and things like that, but to monitor how we're demonstrating and showing those and sharing those with our children. We need to, we're human certainly, but we also need to protect them from some of those anxieties. So. I do see, you know, an uptick in kids worrying about their parents' risk factors or, oh my gosh, I don't want to come to school because my parent might die. Um, you know, that's pretty scary stuff for a student, whether they're five years old or 18 years old. 
Um, but certainly I acknowledge that those, those worries and fears and uncertainties are out there. So um, I'm here to, to support adults, parents, um, staff members as well in kind of managing some of those, um, you know, worries and concerns and anxiety that, that really do exist right now. You know, b besides what Jennifer and Sam have already said, which I completely agree with, I like to think of it in, in these terms. I work with families that are in crisis uh, out, outside of COVID. Families are coming to me because of addictions, because of mental health issues. This was before and, and, and separate from COVID. And I think the same kind of lesson applies to, to those families that applies to all of us now during this shared grief and loss period, which is um, we have to focus on our mental health first. Mm -hmm. you, you know, the, the, the first thing you learn about grief therapy when you're learning about people that have experienced loss is one of the things that makes it most difficult in a family that's experienced a grief and a loss is that everybody grieves differently. And so you can't really rely on each other. You can't get the, the validation or support from the other person because they're in a different part of, of the grief cycle of the grief issue. And so you have to get resources outside of you. And in so many ways, I, I don't think um, qualitatively, there's a big shift for me in the way that I'm talking to, with families because always when a family comes into a crisis, now, like I said earlier, we're all sharing to some extent the, the same kinds of crises, right? The same kinds of issues. But I tell parents, you, you, you need more resources for you. You need support, you need therapy, you need meditation, you need yoga, you need mental health counseling, because if you don't do that, you're gonna inadvertently engage in relationship with your child in ways that you're asking them to take care of your fears and anxieties, right? If their school performance, if their struggles become for, for you something that you rely on to feel okay about how things are going, that's gonna be an extra burden on them. So we go to other places, we go to, to other support uh, folks in our life to, to fill ourselves up, to deal with the anxiety that all of us cannot avoid right now. So that when we, when we come back to the family, to our, to our children, to our little, uh, our little microcosm where everybody's sharing a similar kind of grief, we can be there for other people. So I think we need to find sources of support outside of each other. And, and most specifically, not to rely on our children's well-being or behavior for us to experience peace and serenity. So in a lot of ways, it's the same kind of work that I do be before COVID. And, and lastly, I'll just say a couple of things, which is, um, you know, I think part of the title tonight, Redefining Success, I think what this asks us, I talk to adults all the time who tell me that as they grew up and, and, and they have a, a, a pretty widespread experience of childhood, but they, they'll say, I wished my parents had just asked me how I was doing instead of focusing on getting it right. And I think that the pandemic or any stressor in our life forces us to reprioritize mental health over behavioral success. So I think another thing is, this is an opportunity to say, children can't tell us what they need and what they're not getting. They're just not, it's not in the vocabulary or even their awareness. It's their behavior that tells us what they're needing and what they're not getting. So our job as parents is to, develop the hearing and the vision to be able to see and hear what our children aren't able to ask us with their words and then to respond in flexible, creative, creative nurturing ways. And like I said, we, we've got to find sources of support outside of our family. We've got to find people and ideas and podcasts and books and mental health professionals that can give us a foundation. So when we're interacting with our children, we are a resource for them instead of somebody, another person who's needing them to do something so that that person can feel okay. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, all three of you. Um, and this next question ties in a little bit to some of what you've shared, but I'm hoping we can take it even a step deeper. Um, and thinking about what you've said, Brad, about what children show us and, um, what you've said, Sam, about seeing anxiety tip, tick up. My son last night um, cried before bed. He sometimes does when he's tired, but he's so sad about the thought of Christmas not happening the way it always has with seeing his grandparents and how he's not able to see them right now. And so I'm looking to all of you and maybe we could start 
we could go backwards this time and have Brad and then Sam and then Jennifer help answer this question. What can parents do to help their child, their student navigate these times with shifting expectations and educational experiences? Like what kind of practical tips can we, can we employ as parents to help our kids um, and to take the pressure off? I'll go first this time. I think the most practical tip is to learn how to listen. Um, and that might seem simple and maybe too obvious, but we have to learn to sit with our children's unsolvable problems. And there are losses that are occurring, even with this, this holiday that's just around the corner, that there's no solution to, no, no, no same solution. Obviously with, with grief and loss, some things are, are the same and th some things are different. So to develop a capacity to just sit with somebody and to hear and as a parent to metabolize their grief and their pain, their, their, their sorrow, their, their loss, their anxiety, that's the non kind of simple practical tip of it is you have to develop the capacity to do that. So the thing that we don't need to do is solve it because these are unsolvable problems. Mm -hmm. We all have things that, we, that we've lost uh, in this process. So for me, learning how to listen, you know, s searching sources that can teach us what, what some people call deep listening or, or active listening or reflective listening, a listening that doesn't involve problem solving or, or, or suggestions or advice, but just learning how to sit with somebody's pain is the greatest gift that I think we can give to our children. And we call that, that, that ability, we really call that attachment. But if it's a practical thing that we're asking about, I think it's a listening skill. I couldn't agree more with Brad. I, I, my comment is essentially the same, is to allow everybody in the family and all the kids and the adults to acknowledge how they feel about this new normal. And we're, we're there to help frame that new normal in the context of you know, big world events, but everybody has to acknowledge that, that loss um, of what they're feeling, whether it's about the holidays or whether they got sent home on quarantine. We have students really upset about that. Um, we're there to, to listen and let them, you know, share their feelings. And I'm a parent of an 11 year old and 15 year old. And when our, when our kids are in pain, we suffer because of that parental love. But I also agree with Brad that we don't have to solve it or fix it because truly we can't. And I really see value in suffering. And, and I really think that because of this, the gravity of the global pandemic, I really think we have a huge opportunity to teach our kids because I don't remember a time in my life when we had a global situation, uh, you know, quite at the scale, maybe 9-11, but certainly not my children. And suffering is part of the human experience and part of life. And I think there's great lessons that we can talk about around the dinner table about adversity. And when were some other times in history that you've learned about other people having adversity, whether it's a global pandemic or a war, um, famines, I, these are real things that affect humans. And I think it's a real opportunity to, to teach our kids, life isn't always you know, rosy and sometimes it's very difficult. What can we draw from that? What can we take from that? and maybe talk about our gratitude and what, what we really value and what we really appreciate about what we do have in life. So I think there's a lot of really positive lessons as we're reframing that new normal. Wonderful, I, I couldn't agree more with both Brad and Sam. I would um, expand on the idea around the term presence. I think pr being present, like is not just a parenting skill, it's a people skill. And I think we've, I can say, I teach this and I constantly get hijacked of not being present with multitasking or interruptions or mom this, mom that, or you know, chats coming in and multi multiple screens, whatever it is, just, you know, things are robbing our attention. And I think as parents, and as professionals, the greatest gift we can practice, the skill we all have is to really get ourselves here. And when we are fully here, we're not thinking about something else. We're not projecting on our kids or on our relationships about what we think they need. 
but we're being present. So we're open in a, in a clean slate matter, right? With kind of an observer mind where Brad, we can do what you're talking about. You know, I love the, the quality of deep listening is so underrated. The, the value of deep listening, it's, it's like the magic jujitsu skill that we all need. We wanna be heard, we wanna be seen, we wanna matter, our kids do too. And when we slow down to really absorb where they're coming from, they may not have the words to express it, but we can sense, we can hear, we can see when we are present. And when we do that, we'll, we drop into a deeper level of connection. And there's oftentimes we don't even need to talk. We can just share space. We can hold each other in whatever way that makes sense. And when we are embodied in that presence of attention, we feel safe and we feel like we can then explore our own journey of resiliency, our own journey of figuring it out, whatever it is. And, and I think that's what I'm trying to practice deeply with two kids that my daughter is very expressive, high EQ, 10 years old. And my son is just turned 16. He's very internal, um, you know, doesn't share a lot, not that emotive. And um, in his own way, I have to draw out, I have to sense, I have to listen more. So I feel like presence is such a powerful parenting tool, but it's a people skill that we all have to practice that can change how we relate and how we heal and how we can thrive through a really challenging time. Can I, can I, can I just add something? Cause Jennifer was inspiring me about how presence is underrated. I will tell you that to have a present, empathic, non-anxious other, it will lower the, the nervous system response in the child or anybody for that matter, like Jennifer's saying. And so if you wonder about if this is just some kind of uh, new age idea, this is neuroscience, a, a yeah. parent's, and you all have experienced this when your children were young, when they fell, and the child literally looks at the parent typically the primary caregiver or, or whoever's present to see if they should cry, to see if the world is safe. And so presence is not some abstract idea. It's a really, it's, it's being with a child, having managed and, and gathered resources for yourself in such a way that has a, a calming effect on their nervous system. And that's a big deal when somebody's nervous system is relaxed because they go out of fight or flight mode. They have access to creativity, to resources, the higher level thinking. And so it's not just some, some hippie idea, although it is that too, yeah. but it's mm -hmm. also solid neuroscience and attachment theory. And I would just remark one last point to that, Brad. Um, we have the opportunity as parents to model the way, to model that behavior. And it's not easy, but to that point, there's such a beautiful ripple effect to that. If we can bring that state of full presence just try it. You'll be, you'll be amazed what it feels like even to you to literally sit and look into your child's eyes or really get there, literally allow yourself to drop into your physical body with full awareness and attention. What happens in any conversation? You'll, I, I'm always amazed at the quality and how rich it becomes. Thank you so much. Um, wow. Um, being um, present and um, modeling behavior that um, good stuff. Um, but um, next question, um, you know, really kind of a um, very nice segue um, into that with, with the modeling. Um, what wisdom do you have um, to offer parents um, on how to help themselves? Um, Cause you have to help yourself before your student um, can thrive um, in, in uncertain times. And why don't we um, start with Sam first, if that is all right. Absolutely. So I think we model that self care, you know, as Brad um, mentioned earlier, you have to reach out for your adult support network, whether that's your friend or your spouse, 
your, you have to have your adult connection so that your kids aren't your, you know, sounding board or you're sharing your deepest fears. I mean, I think it's great to be vulnerable. Like kids, I've cr I cry in front of my kids. I tell my kids when I'm struggling, but I also am making sure that I'm seeking, you know, the support I need as an adult and not putting them in that position. So I think we can show our humanity and our, you know, realness. We're not all in control of our emotions 100% of the time, obviously. Um, but I think it's critical that we seek that support and are doing the self-care. Um, I've had that conversation with many adults. I sometimes have it with medical professionals and you feel silly talking to a doctor or nurse telling them like, hey, are you practicing your self-care? But when we're in it, when we're in our stress or in our moment or you know that time of hardship, we all need to be reminded of the simple, I call it getting back to the basics, making sure we're drinking water, making sure we're getting out when there is sunshine for 15 minutes a day, doing your exercise, journaling, um, you know, seeking that social support, whether that's like virtual or in person, but sometimes we even have to remind adults of those getting back to the basics, eating healthy food, getting good sleep, because those are all, um, you know, impacting our, you know, our body is stressed when we're under anxiety and under attack from, from outside factors, we have to really boost our immune system because when we're stressed and we're anxious, and we're running on empty, our immune's taking a hit. So we've got to practice the self-care so that we can then turn to our children and say, you've got to, you've got to also practice your self-care and get your sleep. And here's why. Uh, maybe we can, you know, make some goals around that together. Um, but we need to model that. And I love it when my kids, um, cause I talk to my kids about these issues and I love it when they see me stressed. And I think of this time a few years ago, um, my youngest son was, he was still pretty young and they were really, my boys were really into Kung Fu Panda. And I was so stressed because the one thing I hate the most about skiing is getting into the boots. <laughs> the boots are so stressful because, you know, you park, you get there, you're getting all the kids stuff, maybe you run home to get, you know, the glove that they forgot. And then you finally get there and then you can't even get your own gear on. And my son turned to me and said, mom, you need to find your inner peace. And that was a line from Kung Fu Panda. But I love it then when they like, you teach them the skill and then they turn around and, and remind you. And I think that's awesome. Um, they know that I need to look inward for my skills. Um, and I teach them how to find their skill um, when, when they're struggling, that I want them to turn inward um, and find that self-support. But I also need to model like, hey, when mommy's losing it, I need to turn to my self-support as well. I'm unmuted, so I'll go next, Jennifer. Um, I have three things. The first thing is learn how to say you're sorry because you're going to fail at everything we suggest tonight. So at the end of the day, I think the apology from a parent might be the greatest gift for a child because it's teaching them how to be a human. So learn to say you're sorry, not from a place of asking for forgiveness or again or, or needing something from them, but from a place of love and capacity. So learn to say you're sorry. I was thinking about the idea of breath. I think about this so much because when I lead meditations these days, I think what a wonderful time to, to appreciate and be grateful for your breath when there is a global pandemic that is making it harder and possible for many people to breathe. I can't think of a more relevant time to focus on your breath. So practicing or modeling, and it doesn't have to be formal or long. It can be a matter of seconds to just ask everybody to pay attention to their breathe and to even consider practicing uh, the mantra, I'm grateful for my out breath and I'm grateful my, for my in breath. The last thing I would say is, as we talk about self-care a lot, and, and again, it, it takes, you can't draw from an empty well. And so you've got to have something in your belly when you show up to parent or to a, a loving relationship where you wanna be a resource. I just wanna remind people that self, care is not always self-improvement. And I think sometimes we, we think those are, are synonymous and, and they can be, self-care can be self-improvement, of course, but sometimes self-care is something gluttonous like watching a show or, or, or doing something for yourself or you're not being improved, but you're just, you're filling up the reservoir, right? You're not being needed. You're not being, um, not being even improved or remodeled, if you will, for me, there are certain shows on TV or sporting events that I watch that, that are self-care and, and 
The reason that that's important for me to share with you is because I feel guilty when I'm doing something. If I do self-care, I want to make sure that it's something to improve myself. And so I have to remind myself that self-care is gluttony. My therapist will say often each week, she'll say, I hope you can just stare at the, the, the wall this weekend and watch the paint dry. And she's reminding me that my need for work isn't always reading a book. It isn't always listening to a podcast and, and those things can help. But sometimes it's just putting myself in a situation where, where nobody's needing anything from me, where I'm not giving, where I'm just sitting there taking in taking in something so that my, my, my belly's a little bit more full. So that's, those are the three thoughts I had for that. Well, mine are very similar and I love our synergy. It just makes me smile on this call. Um, very similar, but maybe spoken in a different way. The first I would say is create space. Space is equally underrated as presence. And oftentimes we just don't give ourselves permission to have the space we need in each day to fill up. So an unscheduled, where nothing is on your calendar, you have no obligations, no commitments. It is an hour, a two hour, whatever block for you that you don't have to fill up with tactics or to do's. It's open space, it's, it's meandering time, it's wandering time. And whether you do that inside or outside, but it's an undo event, you're literally not doing. You can choose in the moment to fill that how you want, but creating space for me has been the greatest gift I could possibly give myself because then it translates to, oh, I can give my kids more space. And when they have more space, guess what ha happens? They start to thrive. My son had a really uh, severe, fluky accident this summer during COVID. And without going into all the details, three sport athlete uh, blew out his whole lateral posterior knee nerve damage cannot flex his foot, not sure if he's gonna be able to return to sports. It's been, a, it's, a, it's been a huge thing for our family. Where he's needed space is playing Fortnite, to my demise. Can't stand it, drives me freaking crazy, but that is the space he needed to find a new way to connect, and he is thriving. He, his resiliency is just coming out of him, and we're all equally capable of that. Kids are known to be resilient, but so are parents, so are adults. And giving ourselves the gift of space, I think is, is just one of those tools that can really help us um, survive through this time and thrive and um, be happier and healthier human beings. The second is to Brad, your point about self-care and self-improvement, find what works for you. Like experiment with what filling your cup looks like because we can't give what we don't have. And when I'm depleted and I'm overwhelmed, I become that naggy bitchy parent. I mean, I'm just like, I don't have tolerance because I haven't had space and I haven't given to myself first. And that old, you know, the oxygen mask, mask when we're traveling, like you gotta put it on yourself first. And that is hard for parents to do. Um, because we're givers. I'm a giver, not everybody is, but a lot of us are, and we want to help our children and help our clients and um, community be the best. And being okay experimenting with what works for you, trying things, different things out, and if it lands, it lands, and if it doesn't, you don't have to do it. So if journaling doesn't work for you or meditation doesn't work for you, even though there are wonderful benefits to both, find something else that really speaks to your soul that can help you fill up in a really meaningful way. And the last, and these are not in order, is just don't buy your negative thinking so much. Like the low quality thinking that each one of us has often is corresponded to low moods. And when we can give some space and distance to those thinking, those thoughts that I am not that thought, that I'm having a negative thought, that I have 75 plus thousand thoughts a day and they come and go on their own. And if I'm not attaching to it, it's not gonna form, I won't feel it. 
because we digest our thoughts. So feelings come from our thinking. And I've really noticed a difference when I am not giving so much credit to my low quality thinking, I can rebound and become a happier parent and professional and leader um, in a natural way without having to fix it or do anything about it. So there's a lot there, but create space, find out what works for you and don't buy your low quality thinking as much as we are inclined to do. Oh my gosh, I love it. I told you I needed this webinar tonight. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna circle this um, final question that we have prepared and then we'll open it up to our participant questions. But this question circles all the way back to the quote that Kara shared at the very beginning of our webinar about what kinds of pressures teachers are experiencing um, during the school year. And we're wondering about what your advice is for parents about how they can best come alongside teachers and staff during this time. Um, advice about how parents can ally and be supportive and understanding in regards to how our educators have had to reinvent completely how schools functioned um, and how curriculum is being delivered. And um, Jennifer, I wonder if we can start with you and then Sam and then have Brad go third. Sure. I would um, hearken back to something Brad shared earlier on in the call relating to listening. Ask, ask the teacher what they need because we everybody's so different and it is in a different capability of integrating technology or going from in-person learning to online learning. And every personality is different for each teacher. I've, I've just really noticed that, especially with Hadley's teacher this year, that when we had our teacher conference, actually is one of the best conferences we've I've ever had in the Park City School District was over Zoom. Because it wasn't rushed for some reason. It didn't feel like I had to get in and out. And like, there wasn't a line waiting at the door. Like we had time. And that 30 minutes went, was so quality and finding out what your teacher needs and, and again, mapping that to your students' needs because we have a lot of skills in this town and to, to be able to help. Um, I think the, the challenge with the educational kind of setup, and I think Park City District has done a really nice job is the abrupt change from in-person to online across the board. We've now added another job skill to all teachers in having to know, to be technology savvy, technologically savvy. And not everybody has the same aptitude to multitask and use Zoom and be able to teach in the way that kids need that interaction. And so, I guess I would just ask if you want to be involved and if it's not working or if there's some way that you think you can help, um, asking what your teacher needs to be more successful, asking how they are, asking what they need in their classroom or to deliver online. If we can listen to the answers, I think we'll find that that connection um, grows deeper and we'll find a solution together. So from the school perspective, I'm on the inside, but I'm not a teacher and I'm not in a classroom um, teaching, you know, 20, 30, 40 students. What I have found is the smallest hint of gratitude, the smallest thank you. Um, on my regular general emails, I send teachers about students. I started saying, um, thank you for all you're doing and all you're doing for all students. And then I started getting these replies back like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for saying that. Or I would send a little stress relief, um, you know, stress bubble that I, I send out so staff can put a stressor they have and they watch it float away with a little meditation. And I've always sent things like that throughout the school year, but I've never gotten 10 replies saying, oh my gosh, this made my day. Um, I'm really noticing them sucking up the gratitude that they're getting like sponges. 
um, we had the Hope Squad. Um, the Hope Squad came up with this on their own. They made these cute little packages for all of our staff with a little breakfast bar, some calming tea, some dark chocolate, some stress um, busting ideas and wrote thank yous on these little cardboard boxes, these little gift boxes. And they gave them to staff and staff literally were hunting down who sent these, who sent these. This made my week. This is so amazing. Tell the students that they are making people's day. Um, so I'm just finding the most simple acts of kindness um, towards them is going a long way. And then in reframing the new normal, like for your students, that, hey, we're not all performing on our optimal level, right? If you're a skier and you pull a muscle and you can still ski, you are not at your optimal level of performance. And isn't that a great metaphor for life? Stuff happens in life and we can't be on our A game. And teachers, I'm trying so hard to give teachers permission I know they wanna teach that rigor. They want to teach the way they always teach at such a high level. It's okay to give everybody permission that we're not able to perform at our optimal level. So I think we all have to change our expectations, whether that's of our children's teachers or of ourselves, because if we try to be at our optimal level when we're stressed and taxed, we're just gonna get frustrated. We're just gonna get upset. Um, and we're, we're certainly not going to perform well. So I think we all have to manage our expectations and kind of reset the bar right now. Well, I'm just frustrated because they took my answers. Um, but I'll, 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 I'll use some different words like, like was said earlier. Uh, my mother-in-law in was a, a teacher for her entire career and she's retired now. And after she read my first book, she said, you know, I think you should go to schools and teach teachers about children and the challenges that they have today. This was a couple of years ago, a few years ago. And I said, if I went to schools to teach teachers, I wouldn't tell them about children. I would tell them how to listen and the children would tell them what they need. Um, so what Jennifer said is, is ask is what I was gonna say, ask them what they need because everybody's not the same. And teachers are carrying their expectations from their own life, their own idea, the same way that we all are, like Sam was just describing, they're carrying our expectations. You, you know that teachers have to deal with parent complaint and, and uh, parent feedback and parent anxiety. Um, and so I was going to say the same thing that Sam said, which is sending thank you notes and having dialogues. I've had dialogues with my teacher during, with my children's teachers during COVID where I've said, it's okay. I'm not upset and I know it's a struggle and you're doing a fantastic job. I don't know how you do it. And just had some really, I had a, a conversation with one of my teachers, one of the teachers and I won't get into it at length, but when I said, it's okay to, to drop a ball or make a mistake, she said, um, I'm really afraid to say that because I've said that to parents in the past and they've used it against me. And I said, that's not me. It's okay. Cause I'm dropping balls and my, standard has to be lowered because I'm not at optimum level like Sam was just describing. So I was just going to reiterate the same thing, which is ask, tune in, listen, they will tell you what they need rather than coming up with some blanket idea. But everybody will soak up gratitude at a time when we're beating ourselves up, right? If we can, you know, without going into all the details and all of us can imagine, those that are teachers know it very well, thanking them for, for performing a, an impossible task is a really, really wonderful thing. And it lets a little bit of a burden off them that they have somebody rooting in their corner. And I know it's confusing because we all have gray hairs and wrinkles and receding hairlines, but we're all just children hoping that we're doing a good enough job. And that applies to, to us as parents and to the teachers that are teaching our children. Thank you so much for um, that collective wisdom and, and gratitude. Now is the season of gratitude and it's always Nice to have that, that reminder. Um, we do have one question um, from the audience. Um, I'm just going to um, go ahead and read it so um, everybody knows what the question is. Um, how do you respond when your teenager tells you that the world no longer feels safe? My high school senior, very goal-driven, highly academic, high executive functioning, is feeling she no longer wants to go out into the world. I want to offer this period in time as a comma, not a period. I won't offer false dreams and false, false promises, but I don't want her to lose hope, to lose her dreams. 
not sure if any of our, our panelists want to jump in and, and respond to that about, um, you know, um, children no longer feeling safe going out in the world. I'm happy to share some thoughts, but I see Brad's you, wheels turning. Oh. <laughs> so I'll start. Well, I'm going to give him a, an extra minute to prep. Um, <laughs> just my off the cuff thoughts on that are, um, you know, again, going back to we have some lessons that we can learn from this that there are uncertainties in life and there are things that are not safe and there are dangers out there. There's many others that exist. This is just um, because of the global nature of the pandemic. It's just kind of in your face every time you turn on the radio and the, and the news. Um, but certainly there are risks and there are things that we are not in control of. And I think that this is a good time you know, to talk to kids and take stock and what are the things you do have control over. And we had um, Dr. Wing, our um, medical director at Intermountain come talk to staff about some of their COVID concerns and it was awesome. And my takeaway from that, that I came home and shared with my husband and kids, which I just thought was really a great empowering message is he empowered me that we can all take care of ourselves and be empowered to do the things to keep ourselves safe in this pandemic. And it's like simple things. How do you appropriately wear a mask? Um, how do you, you know, washing your hands, using hand sanitizers, but within reason, right? That there is this risk out there as there are many, um, but you've got to live your life and empower your kids to take care of themselves. We certainly cannot, um, expect other people to always do the right thing. And that's playing out on the global stage and causing fears as well. But I think we need to empower our kids to do the right thing and take care of their own self and their own health and well-being and bodies and, and let them know that they do have some control over what's happening by taking measures. But you know, nothing's 100%. And that uncertainty exists in life with, with many things. So I think we have to be honest with kids. But I think we have to be that cautiously optimistic um, role model that helps them empower them that there are things they can do to protect themselves and to be safe. My youngest, I have four children. My youngest said to me some years ago, we were on a vacation together just with her. Um, and she said to me, as we were kind of cuddling before the day began, she said, I wish all of my siblings were dead. And I had been writing that week, so I was ready for something like that. I, I went against my instinct and I said, wouldn't it be great if you were only child? Wouldn't it be great if we could, all of our time like this could be just dedicated to you? That would be so wonderful. And you saw her shoulders relax and she said, but I would miss my siblings. So in other words, when we learn to deeply listen, we tell our children, thanks for telling me. We, we, we don't gaslight and if you don't, now what gaslighting is, we don't talk people out of their feelings. We welcome them, thank them, tell me more. I'm glad you're talking about it. it makes sense. I can relate. Um, we, we really just lean into it. And what we'll be surprised by, because all of that that I just described comes from a place of capacity. I want to be clear. It's not about a, a falling apart. It's about developing enough um, resiliency, the, developing enough capacity to be able to hold space. And so when I didn't say to live, my daughter, when I didn't say, well, you should be grateful for your, your, you know, isn't your older sister your best friend, as you've said many times, and look at all the things, because that's, the, that's our instinct, right, is to talk them out of it. But when I went with it, she resolved her own concern, right? The nervous system relaxes. And when the nervous system relaxes, the prefrontal cortex goes back online, and people come with creative solutions for themselves. Had I tried to talk her into being uh, a happy, grateful one of four child, she would have done what you all know what children do in those situations. She would have argued with me about why her feelings were valid. So again, listening, leaning into it, don't gaslight and simple phrases like, I'm so glad you're talking about it. Thanks for telling me. I feel that way too. And then let them lecture you, let them give you. It's like the peer pressure lecture. Instead of when your child is susceptible, shows a susceptibility to peer pressure, don't teach them about not having peer pressure saying, I can totally relate to that. Sometimes I worry about what the neighbors think about me. And what you will hear very, very often, your child will then give you a lecture about peer pressure and about how esteem is an inside job. And you've done nothing but hold space, listen and been present with them. So those are some maybe counterintuitive ideas that, that I would coach or, or, or offer. Lovely. 
I would just add, I think I'm just curious about, it, it's such a, a helpful, honest question. And so really appreciate um, Krista, you asking that. I think I'm curious about what it would look like just to allow safety to be inside the home and not force a timeline for the period to happen or not happen. Because I think the concern is as you state that, you know, if I put a pause in a comma, I don't want this to become the all consuming fear that it's not a safe world. And I think it's so easy. And I'm, I do this too, of jumping to what this could mean or what will be, but maybe what your daughter is saying is I don't feel safe right now. And, and, and what, what could safety look like to her? if she had to articulate that, what would that look like inside or outside and both? And maybe just being okay, being inside for a bit, like letting that safety be. And then what happens, it's just, it's such an interesting thing in it. And it kind of relates to thought is that when we fixate on something, we form it. So what we focus on forms. That can be good in the ideas of what we want to manifest. And it can be challenging if we have a fear that we've focused on and then we bring a lot of attention and energy to it. And then it concretizes. What she's pointing to is a need of safety. And what, a lot, what will happen in nature is nature moves, things shift on its own. I think in psychology and a lot of our training collectively, we've been taught that there's a lot of kind of principles or tactics we can apply to help something shift. And that is true. And there's many great tools to do that. Oftentimes the best thing to do is to not do anything, to leave it alone. Because what happens is wisdom emerges. Her own innate intelligence, her own innate wisdom will rise at a place in time where she will then feel safe. And that just may happen in dialogue with you. It may happen in evidence. It may happen in more conversations. Um, but I'm curious if you just let it be and not work, not like put the emphasis on, is this gonna be forever? That we're just gonna be in a place of creating safety. And what does that look like for her? And what does that look like for you in relationship to her? And allowing the natural course to happen. I, I think you may, I've been amazed and surprised when I've left things to work out on their own through time, healing occurs and we just somehow rise to the occasion. Um, I'm not trying to dis dismiss the, um, you know, the, in the, the fear of what's out there and the non-safe world at all. I think her wisdom is showing you as a call to say, let's have maybe a conversation on what could safety look like um, for now and let it be so. Thank you so much. Um... We're actually going over a bit. We have time for one last question. Um, I think Sam is probably the best um, and most appropriate um, uh, panelist to answer this question. Um, uh, is it okay to let your student fail a class during these hard times when they've never failed a class before? Yeah. Well, going back to the, we're not at our opt optimal level of performance. If a student is unable um, you know, to pass a class or to succeed or, it could even be to achieve an A, um, whatever their goal or their standard is for themselves. Like we can all as parents have standards and expectations within reason given our students ability. But I think the most important person's standards and expectation is the student of themselves, especially obviously as they get older and mature and um, use their skills um, that they've developed. But again, it's a teaching opportunity that when you fail, whether it's failing a class or a failure to some students is not getting an A um, and everything in between, that that's an opportunity that we learn and grow from failure. Uh, failures don't define us. Failures propel us forward um, into success 
because then we learn skills to overcome you can remediate a grade, um, Fs can go away when we remediate a grade, um, but there's a lesson that we can certainly learn. So I think we have to, in reframing the, the new normal, talk with you know our student about their, what are your own expectations and goals? Um, when I have one student um, in special education, I have to help him with his goals and figure out what, what do you want to see out of your education? I have another student who might get an A minus and say, I think I should retake that, retake that test. Mom, what do you think I should do? Hey, that, that's on you to figure out if what your, your standard is. Um, but I, I think there's value um, in failures. I'm not advocating for everybody to go out there and get Fs and like, you know, make the world a better place. But certainly if that does happen, that is not the end of the world. That does not define a person. We want young people to know when they fail at anything in life um, that they can use skills and get support to overcome that and come out even stronger than they were before. So I embrace failure um, and certainly you know, feel free to reach out to the school. If you're a student struggling, we, we love our students. We care about our students. Um, we're gonna help um, your students learn the skills um, to kind of manage and maneuver some of these um, pitfalls that, that are happening in times. But kids fail classes when there isn't a global pandemic. So again, it's the same lessons. It's the same skills we wanna teach young people to be happy and healthy. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Sam, Jennifer, Brad. Um, let's all give a virtual round of applause uh, to our wonderful panelists this evening. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. If you would like to support our educators, we encourage you to learn more about our educator wellness initiative. And you can find uh, the, the initiative kicked off this past week with the Lucky Ones Coffee Camper at Park City High School on Friday and Trailside Elementary today. Also in the works is mindfulness training, outdoor activities, fitness classes, and other activities and resources for physical and mental wellness for our wonderful educating staff. Visit PCF4Kids.org to learn more or make a financial contribution if you so feel inclined. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our special guest, Anna Stampfley. Anna is the Parent Education and Community Engagement Coordinator for the Park City School District. Um, I can turn it over to you for a moment or two, Anna. Thanks, Kara. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you PCEF and Mary Krista and the communities that care for this extremely important webinar for our families tonight. Um, as Kara said, my name is Anna Stampfley. I'm the Parent Education and Community Engagement Coordinator for the Park City School District. When I moved to Park City three years ago with my four children, I searched to plant roots for them in this new school district. And um, I think at that time, this position was missing. And the superintendent and the Board of Education heard that uh, the parent education and community engagement coordinator could exist to help parents navigate through a system they may not be so familiar with. So in my position, I will serve as a liaison to the foundations, the community-based organizations, and the municipality, and serve as a navigator for families, both new and existing, to understand the opportunities the school district and the community organizations in our community can provide for their children. Excellent. And um, uh, um, the um, contact information is up on the screen. So feel free to grab a screenshot or uh, take a picture with your phone. Um, so you know how you can reach um, Anna if you do um, have any questions or need more information. Yes, please do reach out. Finally, we're so all, we are very grateful for our panelists and all of our attendees um, for your time this evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can't say enough about gratitude um, in this, this time in this season. Um, and here is our contact information for Park City Education Foundation, as well as Communities That Care Summit County. Uh, please do keep in touch with us. Um, again, the recording will be available in the next day or so. Uh, we will send it out and post the link. Um, and Finally, please stay tuned for additional events and resources on how to help your students um, and our schools during these um, crazy upside down um, uncertain times. Uh, finally, again, I can't say thank you enough uh, for joining us this evening. Have a healthy, safe and happy holiday season. Here's to a better 2021. Thank you all so mm -hmm. much and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Good night.